This is We the Sales Engineers Podcast, show 40. Welcome to We the SE's Podcast, the show for sales engineers by sales engineers with your host, Ramsey Majaba. Ramsey's favorite Nicolas Cage movie is The Rock. Hello again, friends. If this is the first time listening to the show, my name is Ramsey Majaba, and my goal is to build a resource and community for sales engineers by sales engineers so we can all grow, grow and learn and hopefully get raises together. Some background about me. Uh, I've been a sales engineer uh, for a while, but before that I worked for, I've mostly worked for network element manufacturers, otherwise known as NEMS, since I've started my career. Uh, I worked at Nortel before it went kaput, and uh, I also worked for Alcatel Lucent before it was purchased by Nokia. And the last few years I worked as a sales engineer <coughs> My main customers have been network element manufacturers. And I have friends there who tell me that they sell a lot of stuff to service providers, such as Verizon Wireless, AT&T, Orange, whatever it is. Um, Not to my surprise, service providers have their own customers. But for some reason, I did not put two and two together ever uh, and think that service providers since they have customers, they must have sales teams and possibly SEs. Well, for today, my interview is with someone who's a SE for a service provider. My guest today is Nilesh Solanki. And that, as I mentioned earlier, he is a sales engineer for a service provider. And when we discussed it, it turns out there isn't that much difference between being a sales engineer for an M or a service provider. We're doing the same thing. It could be said about a lot of different sales engineering positions. Uh, we talked about a lot of things, like his view of the sales engineering role and how he got to where he is. Show notes can be found at wethesalesengineers.com slash show40. Or if you don't want to type all that out, you can always type wethesees.com slash show40. So without further ado, let's get into the show. Hi, Nilish. How are you doing today? Hey, Ramsey, I'm doing well. Thank you. Well, thank you for coming on. Uh, I appreciate it. I know this is, uh, well, this is the time we agreed to, so I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, <laughs> so how about we start the way we usually start, and maybe you can introduce yourself to the listeners and what you do, who you are, and we'll go from there. Sure. Um, so my work as a solutions engineer with Verizon. Uh, I've been with Verizon for quite a bit of time going on, boy, 16 years now. Uh, It's quite a while now. (laughs) Just recently uh, had an anniversary here. So um, been in the kind of solutions engineering, sales engineering slash solutions architectural role probably going on, um, I would say, about 10 years now. And w- within those roles, I've been in various um, capacities or various uh, 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 scopes of expertise. So, yeah. So, in my experience, I've actually never worked with uh, an SE for, uh, like, you're usually, a Verizon Wireless will be a customer of mine. And it, I didn't think that it would have its own a sales force. So could you let us know what what you guys do as a sales engineer for Verizon Wireless? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, kind of the origins of the company, you know, I'm not going to kind of give the full history there, but, you know, when cellular first came out, it was voice. Um, and then as the uh, network evolution progressed from 2G to 3G, data services started becoming a reality and more commonplace. So, you know, it started to involve just from traditional voice into from SMS to mobile browsing to uh, data connectivity using um, air cards. Uh, and then, you know, from there the leaps to smartphones and tablets 
um, and then cellular enabled routers. So then, you know, just moving away from traditional communication tools to like enterprise grade broadband and replacements for T1s and private networks and VPNs and all of that stuff there. So um, as a sales engineer, when I first started this role, uh, I was kind of an overlay to the sales team there and more of a technical subject matter expert when it comes to data services. So it could have been from back in the early days, like mobility, you know, um, helping customers, uh, you know, move uh, to a more mobile type of environment with their phones. So it could have helping customers educate them on, on BlackBerry Enterprise Server or um, Microsoft uh, Exchange Active Sync there. And then uh, moving and supporting tr um, public safety accounts where they were needing like a fixed um, type of connection between Verizon and their data center to facilitate communication of um, mobile data terminals and police cars and things like that. So um, it was a... Uh, um, uh, that that was kind of where, you know, I got my first start into that. And, you know, prior to that, I was, you know, started in the, in the call centers. I was taking calls and helping customers figure out uh, their mobile web browser and, and text message like that. And uh, I always kind of had a, um, you know, I, I used to take calls from sales engineers at Verizon and it was always kind of viewed as a coveted role where these men and women were, you know, technical, but then they were also customer facing and, but then, you know, they kind of had all of these, um, interesting use cases that they helped with the customers there. So as I went through my call center career and decided to move on, I always had an eye for like, huh, that sales engineering job seems pretty cool. And I think that's something I want to explore. So, Did you go straight from support uh, from the call center to the sales engineering job? No, I kind of uh, took a took a detour and and went into training. So um, I felt like I had a knack, to, uh, the ability to present technical information to a wide variety of audiences. So um, the, as our call center environment grew, as mobile data kind of exploded, um, there was a need for a training department. So once I saw that, I was like, "Yes, sign me up!" And for a couple of years, I became a trainer. So I was training the um, enterprise. Uh, level uh, technical support folks on, you know, new services, new hire classes and things like that. So I really, you know, was able to hone my presentation skills and be in front of an audience and relay technical information and encourage dialogue and things like that. And then, uh, you know, my, my uh, colleagues in the call center, they got promoted to SE jobs and managerial jobs there in that realm. And so I always stayed in touch with them. And then, um, you know, the opportunity came up and I, I, I went for it. Did, did, so you mentioned there's a couple of things that you did that you learned from as a as an SE, like presentation and all that. Is there some negative baggage that you took with you as well from being a trainer to becoming an SE? Well, yeah, this was my first foray into the sales world. You know, I always had this perception of sales kind of being like, oh, you know, just like um, folks are just real slick. You just got to be real like, uh, um, you know, just presenting stuff and selling stuff. And then that's it. At the end of the day, it's all about just, you know, and, and I didn't realize that the, the role was like consultative. It's, it's uh, trade, becoming a trusted partner. It was a lot more facets to it. And I thought I, I would never make the cut in sales. You know, maybe I just was like a technical guy and I can just see, stay behind the scenes. And maybe that was more of my comfort zone, but you know, with the training uh, role, I kind of learned that, you know, my, um, uh, presentation skills were pretty good. I would say maybe the negative baggage was like, um, I'm here to just solve problems, you know, whereas the sales role is, is a lot more to gen than just solving problems. While that's really key, um, it's a lot more nuanced than that. Um, there's a lot more um, dynamics involved in there, which I wasn't aware of. And I kind of grew into the role as I, as I went along. All right, I do have a couple of questions. So one, you mentioned that uh, like there was a bunch of things that you had you didn't know that you weren't aware that that's what you're supposed to do as an SE. Or uh, how did you overcome those difficulties and actually get better as uh, being an SE? 
Uh, it was a lot of trial by fire. Um, uh, you know, when when uh, the sales engineering role first started at Verizon, there, there really wasn't um, any formal training. Uh, a lot of the knowledge was tribal. Um, a lot of the knowledge was like, okay, someone who's been in the, the role, you shadow them, right? And then you start taking those calls and kind of learning the, the verbiage, listening in to the customers there. So, for example, you know, I um, at one point, I had a Cisco certification and I had some aspirations of becoming a network engineer and all of that. This was during the dot-com boom and all of that. I, 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 you know, I came from a non-technical educational background, but I saw technology and, and being in that industry as exciting. And of course, compensation was great. So I was like, I want, I like it. I want to be in it. And, um, and then, you know, fast forward, I, I wasn't using my CCNA cert and that stuff went away. But as I got into the sales engineering role, then the customers were talking the talk about BGP and OSPF and, and routers and command line and all of that stuff. And, and slowly I started like it started trickling back for me. But uh, I, I would say a lot of that was a, um, just kind of learning and being wrote in my memorization and kind of repeating things again and then failing a lot, too, where I wasn't able to answer this really hard questions that some network engineers were thrown at me. So then it, it helped me uh, build relationships within my organization. You know, the smart men and women there that are the network engineers, the um, the folks that, you know, are behind routers that they uh, and, 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 and glean, gleaning expertise from them as well there. So, um, yeah, yeah, it just was a lot of kind of learning <laughs> in those first few years. It is very important for SEs to realize that they're they're not a lone wolf. Like they have support in the back end. Yeah. They can go back to. So so you didn't have any training as an SE. All your training come from sh- came from shadowing uh, other SEs uh, from based on what you just said. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Um, you know, whether that's, you know, having a phone call with one of the senior engineers there just run some scenarios, some use cases or some problems by them, pinging, you know, the my counterparts across the enterprise there um, and, um, you know, just kind of getting more and more comfortable with being in, either in front of the customer or on calls with customers and kind of learning about what kind of business problems they're having and where our solutions could perhaps address it and getting familiar with it. All right. And going back to your background as a trainer, in my experience, there's a big difference between training and demoing. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I, I don't know if you actually saw that, but that's something that I've seen. Is there something that you you, you changed when you're going from doing a training to doing a demonstration to a customer? Right. Um, well, I, I would say in in my particular role there, and, and kind of the, and this is the way we were set up in terms of the services that we were selling. So, it it I wouldn't say demos were a big part of the um, the job. I, I think more of it is now, um, where we kind of go through you know IoT platforms that we offer and go through the services that we offer with our customers. But back then, um, I think it was just more of okay, being able to present the solution, um, maybe throw up an architectural diagram and be able to talk through the flow of, of a data uh, before, you know, as it traverses the network and hits the mobile device and, and all of that there. Um, but um, yeah, I, I would say, you know, it's, it's sort of similar being the trainer there, but you're not, while you you are providing education, um, there, there is still some nuance there where you're, you're also establishing relationships there. Whereas trainers, I think they do establish some degree of relationship with whoever their audiences are, but uh, I think with with sales engineering, it's 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 a lot more. It goes deeper than that, and uh, yeah, uh, that that's how I would frame it. All right, so basically, trainers they do the one time training thing, and it's one and done. SEs actually have to build that relationship going forward because they're going to keep getting calls from these customers to either sell them more stuff. Or yeah. Them. Yeah. Yeah, and depending on your role, it 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 you know it, whether it's pre sales or even I, I would say our sales engineering jobs are both pre and post sales. So we don't end the relationship after the deal is made. Uh, we continue it on and we build upon it. So. 
how much of your time is you would you consider it pre-sales and how much would it be post-sales you know um so so as of uh these days i would say um it's uh in my particular role right now, I think I'm more of a consultative engineer um, where my focus these days is on uh, 5G and IoT or Internet of Things. Um, so whether that's telling the 5G story and presenting that um, to our enterprise grade customers or doing a demo of our IOT platform to our enterprise customers there. So I am pulled in when there's subject matter expertise that is is needed. Um, in my earlier years, I think I was more involved in the pre sales aspects of it, where I would accompany the sales the account manager on a on a uh, sales call there, where maybe they have some uh, you know voice lines of service, they're looking at data, and then I was kind of brought in there. Um, depending on who the account manager was, um, uh, you know, I would either participate actively in the discovery or I would kind of, you know, let the account manager drive things and then fill in where um, I see any gaps or anywhere I can lend some expertise there. So what would be the account manager that you would just sit back and let him take the lead and what would be the account manager where you would actually drive things? Yeah, so it depends. Now, there's <laughs> we're such a large organization, so there's many layers there. So you have your front-end sales teams, the account managers that handle the contracts, the relationships, and all of that. Then you have another layer of folks. These are like solution architects folks where they're like a hybrid of both technical and sales. And then you have folks like me who are subject matter experts on, on various uh, things there and implementation managers and all of that. So um, it depends. Uh, some of the, the first two folks that I mentioned are um, more sales driven uh, there where, uh, uh, where sometimes it, it's latter and maybe we kind of bounce back and forth with, with our expertise there. Um, in, in other cases where, you know, if, if it's the conversations kind of being steered in a way, just kind of listening and there, and if there is um, a need for a particular service, um, this is something I, I kind of like to use is I like to understand the why, what are the drivers behind that? What is the need for that particular service that you're looking for? Because I, I, um, I like to understand, you know, the drivers and then if there's some kind of way that if they were to have this particular solution, how do they measure that success? You know, whether that could be metrics, right? Where are they today? Where do they want to be tomorrow? Uh, I think that kind of stuff is, is very interesting. And I think the account teams do a very good job of uncovering that. But sometimes I will fill in if I see a little bit of that where, hey, maybe there's an opportunity to get a little more quantified. Um, I'll, I'll kind of raise that up and, and kind of dig a little more. So. so if the account manager is doing their job properly, you'd be happy to sit back and listen and interject whenever needed. And if they're like not experts in whatever domain they're in, or whatever domain the customer needs help in, that's where you take the lead? Yeah, yeah. Usually, um, you know, I, I, I don't mind um, if they were to sit back and say, hey, Nilesh, can you just drive this discussion about IoT? What are our platforms offer and all of that? So I'll definitely take the front seat on there um, and, and dig into the customer's use cases more and, and provide that level of detail there. But uh, in, in other cases, yeah, the, the customer, uh, the account teams are subject matter experts in the customer's business as it relates to variety. So I, I defer a lot to their to their knowledge on there. Where I am kind of high level on technical aspects of things, I look at them as partners in filling in the the details about how a particular solution would meet their specific be, um, business. Uh, you know, whereas I'm I support many verticals there, so it's hard for me to become a subject matter expert on each and every vertical there. So it's a collaboration. And to be clear, you're a subject matter expert in the technology that these verticals would use, but you wouldn't know what what they want to use them for. Like you might have an idea because some verticals are similar, but uh, the account team should exactly. Be okay. 
Right, right. So the the day to day, the long relationship, you know, whether they've had prior uh, different solutions with other providers, what is the competitive nature of it, and all of that, and and some of that, I do my due diligence and have like pre calls with the account teams to find out. All right, what? Are we, why are we doing this? What kind of business problem are we looking to solve with this particular thing? And so I let the the account team tell me the story, and sometimes I'll try and also um, learn from them what they think our solutions do because sometimes and and this is no disparaging account teams at all we have so many products and solutions out there and sometimes you know whether it's marketing or things stories can get confused or misunderstood right and so my job is to also educate the account teams on that well yep this particular product can do this uh, but here's where it lacks and here's where it, it it excels at right and just to kind of have that level set before we engage the customer and how many account manage account teams do you work with um, so yeah so I, I uh, quite a number um, so my my responsibility is supporting, we call them client partners, connected solution client partners. So these are the um, men and women who are the kind of the hybrid uh, sales, but then also very solutions technical focused on there. Now, again, some of that some of that expertise may differ from individual to individual. So I support that team and they in turn support various, um, uh, you know, mobility managers or account managers there. So, um, yeah, I, I have a fortunate role where I'm, I'm with um, folks who are very technical minded as well and, and, and kind of that hybrid there. Um, but I support a number of those teams from whether it's retail, professional services, technology, media, finance uh, is kind of my world. All right. So how I'm assuming like if I'm a journalist SE, uh, I work with one account manager. And I'm the guy who usually gets people like you involved. And I have a bunch of customers who email me with a bunch of questions. A lot of them end up, I end up sending to the specialist, such as yourself. So I'm assuming you get a lot of emails from a lot of people asking for a lot of things all the time. How do you make sure you don't drop the ball? Oh, I'm sorry. How do I make sure? You don't drop the ball on any of those. Oh, yeah. Um... That's a very good question there. Um, I don't have the most perfect science in managing this, but uh, I would say one of my expertise, or um, not expertise, but one of a, a good defining skill set of an SE is responsiveness. Um, yeah, you get a tons of things thrown at you. Um, being able to kind of look at the your inbox and see where are the most important messages there and be able to respond to them in a timely fashion. Um, so in, 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 in some cases, it's, you know, pointing folks to the right resource uh, internally or even externally there, whether it's like, hey, we have some fantastic presentation or, or documentation for this product right here. And that's all they, they were needing there. In other cases, it's, um, you know, I have to think strategically and go, huh, this is going to be probably a dynamic conversation. There's a lot of moving parts. Let's get it out of email. And let's jump on a quick call so I can understand it there. Sometimes things get lost in translation, especially when we're working by email, which is a fantastic tool. But I, I'm also a good proponent of uh, let's let's chat. Let's talk this out and then think about this there. And that's where I can provide the, the, the best uh, information there. But um, yeah, I would say say just you know kind of stay on it um you know know who your priorities are who who are the you know the obvious is my leadership M messages to them are a pr priority um messages directly from customers um are usually very very uh high on my priority list there but then also um maintaining and establishing my relationships internally is very important too and so um, I'll do my best to respond uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, but in other cases where I am um, got a pretty heavy workload or I'm traveling, uh, I'll make sure to kind of send them a quick message saying, hey, let me get back to you on this. I got it, you know, like that, and, and, and do my best to get back when I have some availability. So The reason I was asking you about this is, Maybe you could help me with it. Like, I do have a system, which I wrote a blog post about it not so long ago. Uh, but 
generally speaking, I the, the when I first started, this this was the biggest struggle that I had. I get an email from a customer which I don't know the answer to, and then I respond to the customer saying I'm looking up the answer, and then I forward this email or try to try a few things and send the email to the PMs or whoever it is, and then I forget about it. Right. Uh, I don't know if that's yeah. what happened to you. Uh, right now, the way I solve it is that I just put it in my calendar that, hey, f- you follow up with that PM about that question from that customer and then send that email to the customer. But how do you, how, do, how have you ever seen that? Have you ever come, how have you overcome it if you have? Yeah, no, th- there's been times where, you know, I have, um, uh, not really done a, a very good job documenting my, my particular task. So if there's some things that to follow up, whether that's enabling a flag or a reminder, or like you said, put it in my calendar, I, I think I've done uh, all of those. But in some cases, yeah, it's, it's, it's a challenge. Um, I don't really have any perfect system other than um, I like to do my uh, weekly reports to my manager as well. So come Monday of the new week there, I often review like my previous week's report because that usually has very good details about what I have done throughout the week, what's currently open, um, what are some things I'm needing my manager's assistance with. And then from there, I can go, aha, this this needs to, to um, be addressed. Let me follow back up on that there. So it, it would be a combination of whether it's writing lists or um, using uh, like my reminder on my phone, we were, you know, like a notepad kind of app uh, there. And then that fires off an alert saying, all right, follow up on this at 9 a.m. on Tuesday, <laughs> like that. Um, those are some of my strategies there. All right, and, and I'm assuming since we're talking about it, it is working for you. And uh, is this something that you would teach other people to do, or is it just something that works for you, and you're just going to keep doing it? Yeah, yeah. This um, uh, it it works for me, and I'm sure there are other methods that would be far superior. But I just have been doing this, as a, and it, and I find that it it it, it is helpful um there uh, though there is room for opportunity and i'm always kind of uh, curious to how others manage their particular workflow as they go out day to day on there so um you know i'm listening to your previous shows ramsey when you ask the questions with to the other SEs about what are the tools i'm always like oh that sounds interesting <laughs> let me bookmark that and take a look at that and see if it works yeah, oddly enough, this like I every every week I ask that question. Any tips for uh, time management and task organization? And almost pretty much a lot of the responses are, "Well, I don't have a perfect system," or "I am struggling yeah. with this." So it's it's a common struggle for for a lot of people, especially since we get bombarded from a lot of different directions. Unlike like unlike different uh, like when I worked in network support, uh, network engineering, I only had two, three customers at a time. I didn't even have to write mm-hmm. this. Time. I just remembered it everything off the top of my head. So <laughs> yeah. It is a bit right, a bit right, and 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 there's so many ways to get information. You know, whether that's your um, your your laptop, then your mobile, um, and uh, it's it's hard. It, it it really is a challenge, and I don't think there is a perfect solution. Sometimes new technologies to help manage your time may become like hindrances rather than uh, tools for productivity on there, and then you just kind of start abandoning those and going back to just like your notepad with pen and paper and writing down a list and you find that to be more effective as well so the only thing that i use is my calendar yeah like every task that i have to do uh i just because in the end you need time to do that task so i just put it in my calendar that this is the time i'm going to do some follow-up actions and then list the actions in there uh because i i i use different task lists and i always end up not opening those or forgetting about them so Mm-hmm. Or, or losing the paper if I wrote it on a piece of paper. I'm not very organized. Yeah, no, I, I echo echo that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think uh, I'm, I'm starting to become more familiar. We, we recently 
transition to G Suite on there. And so, you know, I, their, their calendar is pretty good. I'm, I'm starting to play around with the, the various colors of the categories there. So, um, like, I'll highlight or code something like red, where I know that's, like, high priority there. And then everything else is various depending on, you know, priority and then, you know, separating out personal things there. So I can take a look at my I, my day and maybe the color coding kind of helps me go, ah, that, that's that's coming up at 10 o'clock. That's important, you know, like that. And uh, so I find that somewhat helpful. <laughs> yeah, I, I've, I, I don't play around with colors. I just, it's all one color. They all have to be done. They're yeah. all one color. But it could be useful in the sense that yep. I feel like we're brainstorming right now. But for my uh, like my colleagues my 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 uh, fellow uh, uh, employees at my company if they want to see if they can book something in and they see something that's colored red they know they can't book over if it's like uh, blue then it's a questionable and if it's green that means go ahead I'll just find another time to do this so yeah yeah I mean even at the at the end of the day it's um we're we're a very email centric organization, and I I don't know if all organizations are are like that. Even though the advancements of the different modes of communication have changed and all of that, I mean you hear companies that are doing away with email, but boy, we I at least I find myself relying on email quite a bit there. And again, I, I'm not sure that's the most productive way of of getting things done. But uh, uh, folks. Uh, do seem to get along quite fine. Yeah. I don't know. I like email because I can send out the question. Like, if I have a bunch of questions to a bunch of people, I can send it out and then turn it off and do mm -hmm. work. So I can bug them, but they can't bug me at the same time. Which there you go. Right, turn, right. Turn right. It back on when I'm actually able to read email. All right. Well, that, that was right. Cool. I think we can talk about time management forever, and we probably never get to a conclusion. So, yeah, no, I think it's a whole separate workshop in itself, yeah. and uh, yeah, like you said, it's there's no end to it. Yeah. All right, so let, let's transition to something else. I, I am curious, what kind of customers do you work with? Um, so when I first started out my career um, as a sales engineer, I was supporting kind of the um, back then we had called regions. Um, so Northern California was a region and that kind of extended all the way to the Oregon border and then to the Bay area and then the little parts of Nevada on there. And then within there, there was anywhere from small, medium business enterprise, um, local and state government, large enterprise accounts to so think fortune 50 fortune 10 uh, types of the big named accounts as well and i supported all three um uh customer segments um and in some cases i was on the only sc in in northern california supporting all three and those are those are <laughs> crazy times but um as of late, uh, I am supporting uh, more of the Fortune 50 uh, customers that are broken down by vertical, so retail, technology, et cetera. Um, and then just just uh, in a matter of a few days ago, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be adding more of the um, small, medium business types of accounts as well. So, you know, that could be startups, um, small shops there, but they're looking to do big things, right? So it's it's across the board. So does the sales cycle differ between your different customers? Like let's say a startup and government. These are the two extremes that I can think of. How does the sales cycle differ? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, in the, in the government, around there there's a lot of regulation there's a lot of budgets uh, fiscal budgets that they have to work with so some some period depending on where they're at in the fiscal calendar they'll have the money to spend and then in other times they don't uh so it, it's a whole and then you know they can only buy off of specific contracts and then and, and there so there's a lot of regulation legality stuff there with, with public safety on them um but with the the smb stuff um, um, yeah, it it's it, it all depends. They they could be more in ver, even a reactive state where maybe they've experienced uh, whether it's a breach or some kind of trouble that made them lose uh, some kind of money or customers or tarred their image or whatever, and so they're coming and going. Hey, Verizon, we need um, X Y Z right from you guys. What can you do for us? 
right? Um, other times it's uh, maybe they're kind of content with what they have. They're maybe looking at the future about it. There may be an incumbent provider that's in the background there. And so they're just kind of saying, all right, well, let's kind of weigh these two operators together and see who's going to give us the best deal kind of thing. So I think it all depends on on the the nature of, of the situation. So you mentioned you're like, you could be in competition with uh, other, other companies. Um, uh, Generally speaking, like I might be uh, completely wrong here, but what would make someone go with you versus somebody else? I guess that's a question for anybody else, uh, for everybody, every single SE. But how do you get them to see the value in your stuff versus somebody else's stuff? Yeah, no, that and, and that's that's the challenge, right? Um, in in the customer's perception, mobile operators are always kind of viewed on the same level field, right? They're like, okay, they're just going to provide this wireless technology, and they have rate plans, and they're all somewhat similar, and that's about it. And in yes. their eyes, they don't see the differences. They don't see AT and T and Verizon as somewhat differences. Now, from a mark- marketing standpoint, and where you see it as there, and being an employee, we do see the differences right um so i guess where that's where you know the 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 solution selling aspects come in to um find out you know has the customer previously evaluated or had do they have a relationship with a, with another provider um have they had a relationship in the past what was it that helped made them move from that provider to verizon uh, or what made them move from verizon to another there that that's the kind of information and on like discovery calls that are kind of critical to understand there. And then, then you know, that's and more of the, the skills of the account team would uh, kind of understand there, like what is, what helps um, a, an enterprise customer, what is their dis- decision criteria, right? What do they use to evaluate each carrier? What makes them, uh, what is it? At the end of the day, is it price? Okay, but if let's say price is equal among carriers, what else is there? Oh, well, we really like Verizon's um, product there. This has got some pretty unique feature sets on there, what you uh, um, are offering there, what the other carrier doesn't offer. Um, but maybe the products are the same. What else is that? Well, maybe it's the support that we provide. Does your other carrier provide 24 by 7 enterprise grade level of support on there? Do you have an account team that visits you whether quarterly basis? Do you, can you pick up the phone and hit and, and, and connect with an SE right away for a, for a particular problem there. So you just kind of got to, you know, peel back that layer of it, that what what's the driving decision of why they should go from one carrier to another on there. And I think... All right. And we're back after some technical difficulties with Zoom... Thank you for sticking on, uh, Nilish. Uh, so you bet. We were talking about uh, competitiveness, and you know, you you knowing your competi- knowing yourself, and knowing your competitor. But you also mentioned that getting gathering all the information from the customer on why they want to do stuff. Do you find customers are open to give that information, or are they more like you have to work for it? Um, yeah, I, I think, I think they are. Um, and well, it, it depends. Sometimes you have customers there and, you know, especially when you're dealing with large organizations, the big fortune 50 named accounts and things like that, there will be folks within those organizations that could be advocates for, um, a particular mobile operator. It could be, they're saying they're big fans of Verizon. They may have in Verizon, uh, or there could be um, folks who are maybe new to the role and they have previous relationships with other providers, right? And so they're kind of like, hmm, I'm not sure about Verizon, but I got some other uh, carriers that I do business with there. So it, 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 it all kind of depends there. And that's where the kind of the discovery aspects of it come into play. Um, but at the end of the day, I, I you know, when I'm speaking to um, 
a particular solution, whether it's our IoT platform. And there are other IoT platforms out there that, that may excel in some functionalities. And, and then there's aspects of our platform that we have strengths. And uh, I can't keep up with the com- competition. And that's not really the game there. My game is to... Um, uh, really showcase our entire portfolio. So not just our platform, but then the network that the devices ride upon, the services that we can also include that help uh, increase your efficiencies, uh, better um, visibility into your devices, um, uh, you know, real-time information, all of that stuff there. So I kind of showcase that and with that kind of whole story rather than going platform A versus platform B, um, I think it gives us a um, better picture of what we can provide as a company. Um, and, and that's what you meant by uh, solution selling. You're not focusing on the product yeah. or the commodity. You're focusing on the entire mm-hmm. picture that they're, they're the, getting. The totality, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, well, or the story really shines. So is, is that like the, the format that you guys use? Do you use solution selling uh, as like the process of uh, your Salesforce? Um, yeah, yeah, I know. We definitely, uh, well, okay. If you were to look at what the executives are saying there, and, and, and this is for all mobile operators, right? Uh, the idea is to grow more revenue um, at the end of the day. We are, um, uh, if you look at the industry, you know, everyone has a smartphone, everyone has a tablet, and that don't get me wrong part of uh, revenues for mobile operators there. But now it, it's time to think more about beyond just connections. It's time to think about like going more up up the stack per se. Yes, we're a network provider there, but then we're also saying, well, what else can we do to facilitate um, and gain more revenues there? So Internet of Things is one revenue stream there where customers can have, you know, thousands of sensors that, you know, talk to the network and focus that hit a back well we can provide apis that help you to integrate with that there we can have cloud connectors to aws to help facilitate that so it's kind of shifting the dynamic from onesie twosie smartphone sale there tablet sale there to more of a full stack type of operation there now that being said our core competencies are networks and managing networks that's where we it also allows us to offer some value-added services as well. So again, you're moving, you're moving away from the commodities sale, selling one or two things to actually selling a solution. But you're not- yeah, the whole solution now, whether that's you know professional services on top of that, whether that's security uh, as well. Or can we um, add to that particular um, uh, solution? Now, it might start with the basic connectivity uh, and all of theirs, but uh, as you, as the relationship progresses and grows, how, what more, what, where can Verizon solve some business problems there? So, um, yeah. All right. Well, that, that's, that's excellent. So, I guess this is, it's time for us to move on to the not-so-fire round. Uh, All right. I need to make it more dramatic than the not so fire round. Well, okay. <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm just amusing myself at this point, so we'll move on. Uh, so, what is the best uh, tool or gadget that you use as a sales engineer? Ah, oh, boy. Um, I'm not sure if I have a beyond just you know my laptop and maybe a pen and pad and and all of that there i'm, I'm going to answer this in a different way there us sales engineers us men and women who are in this role it's a it's kind of a high demand position right you're being pulled in multiple directions you are having to present um, technical information to customers you're an integral part of the sales cycle you're you know you've got reports to give to your managers and this and that there there's a lot going on right um, so what if i think about this question what can i do uh, that will help best or at least most optimized of performers, right? Um, I value like having um, ability to kind of 
pay my full attention to whatever's happening. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm super challenged in that area at times just because of everything coming at you. It's hard to get distracted. You have devices, you have your emails, you got everything coming on. So what can I do to just at least make things a little more manageable there to where I am sitting with a customer and I can just absorb the information. I can think quickly and all of that. So I would say, you know, let's look at getting a good night's rest, (laughs) good sleep, Um, you know, optimizing your sleep there. Kind of look at that. Um, I'm, I'm into also optimizing your there. I'm, I'm, I'm a firm believer of whatever you put in your body can help, you know, uh, help you become, uh, you know, a, a better, uh, better performer. Right. So just bombed out at the end of the day, or even by lunchtime, you're taking a nap and, and all of that there. Um, what can you do to, to kind of have, you know, boost those energy levels up there? So diet and then moving some. So whether, you know, if you're stuck at your desk, try and get up and, and move around and, and uh, kind of get those, you know, muscles moving. Um, if you can have some time to get to a gym or it doesn't even have to be a gym. Maybe you can do some exercises where push-ups or squats or something. Is that this, my focus is more on kind of that mind body kind of development. And then I, at least that's my hypothesis of, of helps me become better at my job or, if that makes sense. <laughs> so if I were to summarize in the context of this question, uh, the essential gadget or tool that you should be using is your body, so take care of it. That, I think that's what you're trying to say. Yeah, take yeah. I, I would say take care of your body, take care of, uh, you know, I, I would frame it up as self-care as probably one of the best tools that you have. Um, it's easy to like, uh, you know, uh, as you're traveling around, hopping on a plane at a hotel, you know, you're not sleeping well, you're crossing many time zones, and you're probably eating a lot of desserts and, 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 and stuff like that. And don't get me wrong, enjoy life and all of that there, but kind of look at, you know, uh, wh- where you're at from time to time. How do you feel? How do you look? How do you how do you perform? And then try and make some adjustments there and see if that improves things. Speaking of squats, I have been asking my uh, HR to provide us a squat rack at my office, and it has not worked out so far. And uh, uh, yeah. I'm 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 sorry to hear. I hope that does change. Um, yeah, I'm well, fortunate that we have a small gym at the office and they have a squat rack. So okay. I, I have to invite you down, Rand. Yes, I'll, I'll come down just for the squat rack. Not to see you, just the squat rack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just the squat rack. <laughs> Is there any uh, book or resource that you should think uh, every SE should read? Uh Shameless plug, Ramsey, your show. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming people who are already no, um, listening and, to the show don't need this plug, but yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, in, in all seriousness, I, I think, you know, you are providing a valuable service. And how I stumbled upon your show was like, oh, well, what's out there for a sales engineer? And I just plugged in sales engineer in my podcatcher and your show came up. I'm like, finally, someone who's talking about what we do on a day to day. Okay, let me listen. So, yeah, I would definitely say resources like you just kind of do a search for sales engineering. What's out there? Are there, um, you know, webinars, workshops you can take to kind of help better your um, skill set and on that. Um, as far as books, boy, that's, I honestly, I, I don't have any book recommendations because I tend not to gravitate to kind of those books that, oh, you know, this is going to help you with your time management or um, this is a, a book by some kind of CEO that gives you the 10 tips to solution sell. Uh, no, I'm, I'm totally open to that. If there is a uh, book that, um, you know, would definitely benefit a sales engineer, I'm all, I'm all for it. Um, but for me, I'm, I, I use books for pleasure reading and for, and for more for information there. So, um, I don't know, a good science fiction book always, uh, <laughs> All right. so what's your favorite science fiction book? Um, I'm really enjoying the Expanse series, uh, by James Corey. Um, so that was, uh, 
Uh, it was made into a TV show that I think got canceled after the third season, but Jeff Bezos was a huge fan of the show. And so I guess Amazon is picking it up. Uh, but the books are, are excellent, in my opinion. Um, just really sprawling, um, uh, uh, just you know, s- stories about the geopolitics between p- planets and Earth and Mars and then the belt in between. It, it's great. <laughs> so that's the benefit of being the CEO of your own company. If you, you like a show and you don't want to see it canceled, you can just pick it up and bring it on right. to your own series, to your own company. That's the, yeah, that's the done only, and done. That's the only reason people would want to be CEO, really, just to watch their own shows. I think I think I think you're right. All right so I already asked you, we already talked about uh, time management so I'm going to skip that. I'll ask you something else uh, after. Uh, is there what's the best advice you've ever received? The best advice and this is going to sound cheesy but I remember um when I first joined the sales engineering role and one of the senior engineers on there, I, I expressed to him like, Hey, I'm, and he's such a, I love his personality, right? He's, he's just like friendly, engaging. And he was just like, have fun. <laughs> so, yeah, so you, and you, I don't know. That, you, no, sorry to that but struck you, me. You cut off a little bit. So we, I didn't hear we, what you asked your colleague. Oh, I expressed to my colleague that um, I was nervous about joining kind of this high performing team and, and all of that. And, and he was just saying, he just told me, have fun, you know, okay. relax. And I was like, huh, okay. Um, That's easy and, said, it, you know, yeah, I, 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 that in, in that moment, I was just like, okay, that's, that, that is the key there. Um, and as I go through, you know, pa- fast forward to the, there is like, you know, when I'm getting prepared for a meeting and all of that there, yeah, there is some anxiety, you know, how should I present this information? Do I got all my talking points right about this particular solution? You know, what is, oh, I'm looking up the customer's profile, the IO, oh, they're going to want to know about this and that. And then, you know, I'm trying this and this is not perfect by any means, but just to kind of relax in that moment and kind of turn off that, that ruminating mind just for a moment and kind of ease myself into the situation and just just say hey man i'm here to tell a story and just kind of relax and i find that my my uh, discussions are um i don't know i feel like that's more of a, a real me if that makes sense um rather than hey i'm just coming at you with all these solutions and i'm the company guy and this and that um i feel like it helps me kind of get grounded and uh, from that space i'm i'm a little more authentic if that makes sense and i find that um customers resonate with that more the more transparent the more down to earth you are uh but then still able to provide them the information they need and it makes for a really dynamic and engaging type of experience so to add on to that like the what helped me is just to think about i'm not there like i'm not the enemy i'm here to help them right i'm here to help the customer i'm here i'm equal to them i'm not inferior i'm not superior i'm just here to help you guys do whatever it is that you need to do and i felt when i started thinking that it took a load off of me like Mm-hmm. It's no longer a matter of uh, life and uh, sales. It's just let's help each other out and see what happens, and that helped me relax a little bit too. But that comes back no, to that, what you were saying. Yeah, no, that that's totally fantastic, and and sometimes to help my kind of nervousness over my anxiety um, is humor. Uh, I tend to think I'm somewhat funny (laughs) that's debatable depending on who you talk to but i look at the great comedians there and how they're able to um present they're presenting right they're telling stories to a large audience and that's boy that's nerve-wracking there but how do they masterfully do it you know and and so i always like to um start out with maybe just an an icebreaker just kind of something there that i can think about this particular customer's line of business and how i interact 
with that particular business and just kind of make a interesting observation about it, about myself, you know, and, 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 um, I, I, I kind of, sometimes I'm self-deprecating in the way, you know, like, uh, and, and it's true. I don't know all the answers and I'm not going to pretend that I do. And, and sometimes that just kind of eases things and they, they see me, uh, hopefully as a more of a trusted provider, a partner. So do you have, all right. So I'm replacing the, the questions about the tip or tip or trick time, uh, tips or tricks for time management to this. Do you have okay. a go-to joke that would break the ice? <laughs> ah, geez. Um, no, I think a lot of this stuff is like, it's like on the fly for me. So like, for example, if I'm meeting with like a retailer, okay, I try and think about like, have I engaged with this retailer, you know, on my own, right? You know, personal life, right? And then see if there's anything from there that I can tie in with my own life. And that is somewhat funny, you, you know, uh, I don't know. It's just all about kind of thinking on the fly there and just, just kind of making it humorous there where I'm like, um, opening it up and just like, Hey, this is, this is me. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's spontaneous. It's spontaneous uh, is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> right, yeah, that works. Man. That works. Well, that, that's it. That, that brings us to the end of the show. Uh, th- thanks a lot, Nilesh, for coming on. And uh, I know uh, today we had some technical difficulties, but I appreciate you sticking uh, through it. And uh, hopefully folks will enjoy it as much as I did. Uh, Ramsey, it, it was a pleasure speaking with you, and thank you for having me on this show. I really appreciate it. It definitely is my pleasure as well. Thanks, Nilesh. Thank you all for listening all the way through. I hope this episode was informational. I enjoyed talking to Nilish, and he was very easy to talk to. Uh, It did not feel like an interview. It felt more like a discussion between two friends who just love what they do. And uh, I'm finding that as a common thread or a common trait between most of my guests where I talk to them maybe like I've never met most of my guests and I ended up talking to them maybe once before the interview. In some cases, we just meet, like we just dis- we discuss everything via email, and then we meet for the first time on the while we're doing the interview. And when we talk, it feels like we've known each other forever. At least that's how I feel. I feel like I've known them forever. It's an easy conversation, and this is common. F- uh, like it's a strength for us used to be able to do that to make put people at ease, make it feel like. They've known each other so so and Nelesh was like that. Nelesh made me feel at ease. Um I I hopefully I made him feel at ease. Uh because there's a little bit more pressure on him. I've been doing this for a while. This is the first time he's done it. So thank you, Nelesh, for coming on and actually having the chat with me. Before we leave today, just a reminder, a webinar next Saturday, which would be Saturday, January twenty sixth at one thirty PM. And the topic covered will be building relationships with customers. I hope to see you guys there. Show notes for this episode will be at wethese.com slash show40. And with that, thank you for being here. This is Ramsey signing off.